to be talking about a framework for understanding theory of mind and the developmental stages of theory of mind. A deaf child is not a hearing child who cannot hear. Hearing loss leads to global changes in neurocognitive functioning. 1978, Premack and Woodruff defined theory of mind as the ability to attribute mental states, beliefs, intents, desires, pretending knowledge to oneself and to others, and to understand that others can have beliefs and desires and intentions that are different from one's own. Now then I'm going to call cognitive theory of mind. And until kind of the early 2000s, that was the definition of theory of mind. And when people said children had or did not have theory of mind, they were usually referring to children's ability to pass what were called first order false belief tasks. Here's a five-year-old passing one of these tasks. The first pirate. His name is Ivan. And you know what pirates really like? What? Pirates really like cheese sandwiches. Cheese? I love cheese. Yeah. So Ivan has his cheese sandwich and he says, yum, 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 I really love cheese sandwiches. And Ivan puts his sandwich over here on top of the pirate chest. And Ivan says, you know what, I need a drink with my lunch. And so Ivan goes to get a drink. And while Ivan is away, the wind comes and it blows the sandwich down onto the grass. And now, here comes the other pirate. This pirate is called Joshua. See? And Joshua also really loves cheese sandwich. So Joshua has a cheese sandwich and he says, yum, 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 yum. I love cheese sandwiches. And he puts his cheese sandwich over here on top of the pirate chest. So that one is his. That was Joshua's. Then, That's right. And then his went on the ground. Yeah. That's exactly right. Now. So he won't know which one is his. Oh, so now Joshua goes off to get a drink. Ivan comes back and he says, I want my cheese sandwich. So which one do you think Ivan's going to take? I think he's going to take that one. Yeah, you think he's going to take that one? All right, let's see. I told you. Oh, yeah, you were right. He took that one. So that's a five. So he clearly understands what Ivan knows and doesn't know, and that Ivan will think his cheese sandwich is on the chest because that's where he left it. A younger child predicted that Ivan would pick up the sandwich was on the ground because after all that was his sandwich and when Rebecca Sachs the researcher challenges him he said he didn't want the one that was and she shows him that Ivan takes the one on the chest the child says oh he didn't want his because his was dirty on the ground now the work in social neuroscience has shown us that there's more than one type of theory of mind with the advances in fMRI, we're able to see how the brain is functioning under different kinds of tasks. So the work coming out of uh, Simone Chimay Torsi's lab has found that when people are doing cognitive theory of mind tasks, it requires particular lateral areas of the brain, particularly temporal parietal juncture, dorsal lateral prefrontal, some of the um, medial prefrontal. When, however, you're thinking about someone's feelings as opposed to their thoughts and knowledge, it involves inferior lateral frontal gyrus, ventral medial and orbital frontal lobes of the brain. And it's possible for individuals to pass one of these types of tasks to do cognitive and not affective or to be able to do affective and not cognitive. Now we're going to make this even more complicated. Not only can we talk about cognitive theory of mind, thinking, knowing, believing, but an affective feelings, emotions, but also whether you're thinking about other people's thoughts and feelings, interpersonal, or thinking about your own thoughts and feelings, intrapersonal. And it turns out that when you're thinking about the thoughts and feelings of others, you use more lateral areas. 
When you're thinking about your own thoughts and feelings, you use more medial areas. The Lombardo study asked people in Great Britain uh, to evaluate statements in terms of how the queen would think or feel about them, the statements, or what they would think or feel about them. And again, they found those differences that if they were thinking about what the queen would think, more lateral activation, if they were thinking about how they would think or respond to those statements, more medial areas. So what I want to suggest to you when you're working with um, young people, adults, you want to develop a profile of their theory of mind skills. Cognitive, interpersonal, do they understand the thoughts, beliefs, desires of others? Can they infer the mental states of others? Can they infer people's behavior based on their thoughts? Cognitive, intrapersonal, can they reflect on their own knowing, remembering, and forgetting? Can they plan their own behavior? Can they use what they don't know and don't know to figure out how to learn something new? Their affective theory of mind. Can they recognize the emotions of others? Can they infer them? Can they infer what someone might do because of those emotions? Can they empathize with others? And affective intrapersonal, can they reflect on their own emotions? Can they regulate their own emotions? Now, if we look at the literature on hearing loss, deafness, and theory of mind, we find indication that there can be deficits in all these different aspects of theory of mind. And keep in mind that teaching one aspect doesn't mean that the others will automatically come in. You need to consider each aspect or each dimension of theory of mind. The research for quite some time has shown that deaf children of hearing parents are very delayed in passing those false belief tasks, such as the Ivan the Pirate task. Typically, deaf children of deaf parents pass those tasks at the same age as hearing children. And so until quite recently, it was assumed that deaf of deaf then had quite normal theory of mind development. But recently, the O'Reilly and Peterson and Wellman study has shown that even deaf of deaf have delayed development of other aspects of theory of mind and can be quite delayed in getting to the same level as hearing individuals. Cognitive interpersonal deficits also involve difficulty in inferring the thoughts and intentions of others, again, making inferences about their behaviors based on their thoughts and intentions. Then there can also be deficits in cognitive intrapersonal time. Studies have shown that the deaf students tend to be less aware of when they're comprehending and not comprehending. And probably as a result of that, they use fewer strategies to help them comprehend. They also tend to show um, greater difficulty in executive functions in regulating planning behavior. Again, because you have to be reflecting and thinking about your own behavior if you're going to plan it. And there are affective interpersonal deficits. A number of studies have shown that uh, individuals with significant hearing loss deafness have greater difficulty than hearing people in recognizing people's emotions, putting labels on the emotions, sorting pictures, put all the happy faces here and the sad faces in this pile and the angry faces in that pile. The researchers that conducted those studies initially thought, well, if you have a hearing loss, vision will compensate. And so they expected those with hearing impairments to do better than hearing people on recognizing and sorting those emotion pictures. So they were rather surprised when they didn't. They suggested that perhaps the oral deaf weren't quite as good because they were looking at the mouths and they were missing other facial and body cues. And perhaps the signing deaf weren't quite as good because they were looking for linguistic uh, sign language cues and that took up working memory so they couldn't attend to some of the other emotion cues. I think there's some other explanations 
for that, however. One of my friends who's been the principal for our state school for the deaf said that she thinks what might happen with sign users is that the signs for emotions are very stylized and are on the face and on the body for often what could be a few seconds. In actual conversations, emotions are microseconds and often they don't look just like the sign. Another friend of mine who has a severe hearing impairment says she thinks it's because she has to work so hard at listening and trying to hear that she can't attend to the other cues. Well, those deficits in recognizing the emotions also uh, results in problems kind of figuring out how people would feel in different situations, being aware of What's the relationship between situations and the emotions uh, and predicting how people would feel in different situations? And then there are deficits in affective intrapersonal. And some studies have shown that individuals with severe hearing loss are more likely to ha even have difficulty and always identifying the feelings they're having and in regulating those emotions. And fewer, less detailed autobiographical memories. Autobiographical memories are your memories for yourself in time. And those are best established by having conversations about experiences and not just, we went here, we did that, but how you felt, what you were thinking, what other people were thinking and feeling. It requires a sense of self, but having people code those experiences with you also helps you develop a sense of self. And the better autobiographical memory you have for the past, it turns out the better able you are to plan and regulate the future because you can also see yourself in the future. I want to show this video clip of this uh, young woman, Elizabeth. I've known her since she was a little girl. Elizabeth was born with bilateral atresia, uh, so uh, no outer ears, no middle ears. Uh, on one side she uh, has a cochlea. She for many years had a single-sided bone conduction aid. In her 20s she received a Baja. Her first degree was in fine arts with an emphasis in photography and film. And she went into that because you don't have to listen very much. When she went to the university, they heard her talk and said, your speech is perfect. You don't need anything. And they did not require that her professors uh, use any type of um, FM system. Often people don't understand that hearing aids don't give you normal hearing. Elizabeth's mother says that in a way her perfect speech is both a blessing and a curse. Uh, people don't realize how hard she has to work to listen. Well, Liz knew nothing about theory of mind. Um, Right uh, shortly after she received her fine arts degree and she was working as a photographer for the Air Force and we took her to convention with us and said we uh, want you to help us develop our poster sessions. Uh, we're speech pathologists, we know the theory, but we're not good at making pretty posters so you have these skills. Well after two conventions Liz approached her mom and said I want to become a speech path pathologist. Liz did, uh, two years ago now, I signed off on her clinical fellowship year. And as she was going through her program, I gave her materials to read on theory of mind. And she began realizing, oh my goodness, that explains trouble I had. Neither her mother or I realized that Liz had deficits in these areas. As she read, she began to understand the kinds of difficulties she had had with people. And this is one of the early times here she's explaining this. So I'm not sure when exactly I became aware of it, but it, I do know that I was trying to 
use books initially to try and gain some insight to people. Um, they explain a lot of emotions, especially um, in younger uh, books, the uh, children books. They explain a little bit more and give more in depth to what emotions are going on. And I would, I know I would read a lot of um, Sweet Valley High books and stuff like that. <laughs> and um, but books along those where they were geared towards girls, so there was a lot of emotions in those. And I was really trying to read those to gain insight to what kids might be thinking or liking because I did realize that I wasn't always able to connect to people and I wasn't sure on what level I wasn't entirely sure if it was just likes and dislikes or different backgrounds and so I was trying to read a variety of different books to try and see what authors were saying and interpreting through other kids um, or students in school of how they interpreted school because I knew I was missing something but I wasn't entirely sure how to ask people how they were thinking I wasn't entirely sure how to approach it or ask adults because it didn't feel like it was an adult question it really just felt like I couldn't relate to my peers so it started with books and then um, I I realized that books could only do so much because um, they explained a lot emotion-wise, um, but how did that actually look visually? Um, there aren't captions in everyday life that follow people around, so you can't really get into their true thoughts, um, what they're actually thinking. Um, the same way that you do in a book. So I guess that's when I sort of started turning to TV and movies because I did see a correlation between the two. And I, I started using books and movies to try and figure out people a little bit more. And I guess it started gravitating more towards the television and, and movies aspect because I felt like it was... I felt like it was um, more true to life, the better the acting was, the more subtler the cues and the more you had to read between the lines and you could watch it over and over and over and learn something new. You could learn something new about other characters, you could learn something new um, about the same character that you never saw before, especially with really good directors. And I asked her, how did having that degree in film help? And she said, I've learned to look at people through the eyes of a director. I know what a director's wanting to convey, and so what is he having people do? Now, you need all these dimensions of theory of mind for social interactions. You also need them for comprehending text. So let's say you're listening to the story of the hungry hyena, and it's a sunny day, and the hyena notices that fish eagle has caught a nice shiny fish. And hyenas are very greedy critters. And he calls out to fish eagle, hey, is that your big nest over there in the sausage tree? And the eagle says, well, yeah, why are you asking me that? And he says, oh, you know, I just saw a snake climbing that tree. Perhaps he's looking for your eggs. So fish eagle flies off as fast as the wind back to her nest, and she leaves the fat fish behind. Now, use your cognitive intrapersonal theory of mind to realize, I know in a number of stories, hyenas aren't nice. You can't trust them. You would use your cognitive interpersonal to realize hyena's tricking eagle. He didn't really see a snake going up that tree. You use your affective interpersonal to realize eagle's worry. She's so worried she's forgotten that she's caught that fish because all she can think about is something's going to happen to her eggs. You might use your affective intrapersonal to remember how you felt when someone tricked you 
in your affective empathy, you might feel the anger and frustration that the eagle felt when she realized she had been tripped. The theory of mind begins with attuned interactions from the time of birth. This affect of coordination between the gestures and expressions of the infants and their caregivers. A series of photographs captures a wealth of interaction which transpires between seven-day-old Jordan and his grandfather during one 30-second period. Jordan and his grandfather have discovered each other. They begin a playful interaction while they look eye to eye. Jordan looks at grandfather's mouth and sees it open. He imitates this action and again looks eye to eye. As grandfather opens his mouth wide in laughter, Jordan follows, opening his mouth even wider. Jordan throws his arms in excitement and watches his grandfather's eyes, lifting his head like grandfather does. Now it's a game between them. Notice how Jordan lifts his left arm and actually reaches out and touches Grandfather's mouth, where the game is being played. Grandfather now opens his mouth wider. And with great energy, Jordan follows suit. They take much delight in this joyful engagement. Jordan throws his head back and opens his mouth even a bit wider. A moment of pause but they're still engaged. There's indications that deaf infants, particularly of hearing parents, have more difficulty in engaging in these attuned interactions. This is a classic video of a deaf baby having his implant Return turned on for the first on. time. And he's back on again. See how he turns? Hi, Jonathan. Talk the fucking... And then he begins mirroring his mom's mouth movements. Could you hear that? <laughs> Hi. Hi. You got that, Dad, right? <laughs> you have the sense that they probably never had this same type of attuned experience before. Now, by the end of the first year, by 8 to 12 months, children are also able to determine the emotional meanings that you're expressing. So not only do they look at your face, mirror those expressions, but they're able to interpret those expressions. This is a classic assessment for this. This baby's crawling across the table. The table becomes plexiglass, so it looks like there's going to be a big drop off, even though there isn't really. And watch what this baby does. In this situation, the baby will check with her facial expression. And then what we do is have the mom either smile, in which case the babies tend to go across or look afraid and that affects the babies and they stay back. The baby looks at the drop, then checks with his mother. The baby drops down and backs away. So even when the drop is shallow, the baby won't cross when warned off by his mother's facial expression. Now, what will happen if the mother smiles? Once she smiled, he picked up on that and was trying to come across. He, he turned around and started treating this like a step. Okay. Now, you have to reference someone, not just once, but if you're playing with someone, you have to look at them, reference them, figuring out what they are thinking or feeling. They have to reference you. This has to go back and forth. Lots of children with language impairments, for a variety of reasons, have difficulty coordinating this referencing. This is a deaf mom with her three-year-old son with significant hearing impairment. And I want you to notice how well they're coordinating or co-regulating their referencing. Now, Dom is pretending that he's a dog. And he comes over and signs he wants something to eat. 
he referenced mom references him he references her and she says do you want chicken you want chicken he references pretends to eat the chicken he gets up she references him saying do you want more chicken he references gets rid of that first piece here comes the second piece of chicken he eats that drinks he's done drinking mom references do you want me to wash you he references her he references again crawls over he's staying in the role of a dog he says okay I'm gonna put soap on you but first the water then he's he's going to start crawling away but she says no remember the soap he references he scoots back into position she lathers up the body and the legs and the paws And then she says, got her and shoe off. He references, scoots back into position to get washed off. Okay. So coordination of this referencing. Around 18 months, children show a sense of self when they are re aware that they are separate from someone else. Here's classically how this is investigated. The experimenters place Bobby before the mirror. But it's unclear whether or not he recognizes himself. Continuing with the experiment, they put rouge on his nose. If he has developed a sense of self and a standard about how he ought to look, he will show it with an unmistakable expression. And the way we can tell the child recognizes himself is to see whether or not the child touches its finger to its nose. Notice that after recognizing himself, smile, turns his head down, and avoids looking in the mirror. So that's a sense of self. That's an aspect then of cognitive intrapersonal theory of mind. Another major aspect of cognitive intrapersonal theory of mind at 18 months is the emergence of pretend play. You have to cognitively be aware that you're pretending. This block is just a block. I can pretend it's a cookie. I can pretend to eat it, but I'm not really going to eat it. And there's development of this aspect of theory of mind in pretend. Initially pretend on self and then pretend on dolls and then pretending to take on roles that's going to require both inter and intrapersonal cognitive and affective theory of mind. You have to know what someone else is thinking and feeling to really take on their roles. Now, in the preschool years, children's vocabulary is expanding rapidly. And in addition to all the color shapes, sizes, numbers, nouns, and verbs, you want to make sure that children have the vocabulary for emotions. Happy, sad, mad, surprised, disgusted, and afraid. All languages around the world have words for those emotions. And by five, children should know those words. They should be able to identify those expressions. They should know when people feel that different way. So a happy face would go with a birthday party and a surprised face with mom with pink hair and a disgusted face with eating awful tasting food. And between four and five, passing these first order false belief tasks come in. First order means predicting what someone is thinking or feeling. Okay. Some things that come right before that are recognizing that different people have different desires. So it's uh, a cognitive theory of mind and realizing that based on those desires, they will have different emotional responses. Tom hates lettuce. Peter likes lettuce very much. Here's what's in the box. 
How will Tom feel? Well, he's going to feel rather angry over this, or disgusted, because he doesn't like lettuce. But Peter, who loves lettuce, will be very happy. Cognitive theory of mind involving that seeing or hearing involves knowing. That you can't know something if you didn't see it or someone didn't tell you about it. Here's a chest. What do you think's inside the drawer? Oh, well, look, there's a duck. Now, here comes Jim. Jim's never seen inside the drawer. Does he know what's in the drawer? Well, no, because he didn't see what was in there. So children should pass these tasks a little before they pass the false belief tasks. Now, the Ivan the pirate was a cognitive false belief. Ivan didn't know his sandwich was on the ground. This is an affective false belief. Here's a little bunny. And rabbits just love carrots. It's their favorite food. There's a fox behind that bush. Foxes like to eat rabbits. But the rabbit doesn't know the fox is there. So how does the rabbit feel? Well, he should be really happy. He's got his favorite food. He doesn't have any reason to be scared because he doesn't know there's a fox behind that bush. Now, seven-year-olds are getting even better in affective theory of mind and specifically intrapersonal affective. They're learning to regulate their own emotions. This comes from a task that pawns developed. You say, remember that rabbit I showed you? Well, that rabbit was eaten by the fox. The fox did eat the rabbit. And that rabbit belonged to this little girl. So how does she feel? She's feeling really sad. Well, that night she goes to bed. The next morning she gets up and she's looking at a photograph of her best friend. How does she feel? Oh, it's probably good. It's her best friend. And then she comes across the photo of her rabbit who died yesterday. How does she feel? Oh, she is so sad. She so loved that rabbit. What can she do to make herself feel better? And even seven-year-olds begin to think of some. Go talk to mom, watch TV, call your best friend. Okay. Second order, uh, cognitive and affective thought, as Paul's affective theory of mind comes in around seven, can come in earlier with highly verbal children, and of course later with children that have any kind of language differences or delays. This is predicting what one person thinks another person is thinking and or feeling. This is the classic assessment task for second order cognitive false belief. John and Mary are in the park together and there's an ice cream man there and Mary wants to buy some ice cream and then she realizes she left her money at home. But the ice cream man says, oh, I'm going to be here all day, don't worry about it, you can come back later and, and get your ice cream. So Mary goes home. Now John's in the park and while he's there he sees the ice cream man's packing up and leaving. And he runs over and he says, where are you going? And the ice cream man says, oh, I'm not selling much ice cream here in the park. I'm going to drive over to the church parking lot. So the ice cream man drives over to the church and on the way he passes Mary's house. Mary sees him and she rushes out and says, where are you going? He says, oh, couldn't sell much ice cream over at the parks so and I'm going to drive over to the church. Now, John doesn't know that Mary talked to the ice cream man. John's gone home. He's working on his homework in the afternoon, and he needs some help. So he goes over to Mary's house and asks for her. And Mary's mom says, oh, she just left. She went to get some ice cream. So John runs to look for her. Where does he think she has gone? First order false belief. He thinks she has gone to the park. Why does he think she has gone to the park? Because he doesn't know that she knows the ice cream man is at the church. Second order, he doesn't know that she knows. Okay. And with that, children also become aware that there are times you should hide your feelings. They should be coming in around age eight. This is Jason. He's eight. He has a primary diagnosis of attention deficit disorder. He was part of a project we did looking at language skills of children with ADHD. 
and many of them do have higher order language difficulties. Well, in this task, Lee, the adult, is giving him some vignettes such as this. This is Chris, and this is Chris's grandmother. And Chris tells his grandmother that he wants her to make him a really scary dinosaur costume for Halloween. And this is what she makes. Now, this is Barney. He was the dinosaur in a TV show for preschool children. And Barney is clearly not a scary dinosaur. So listen to how this goes with Jason. Blech. How does he feel? So he said, you know, that Chris feels mad, and what should he say to his grandma? I don't really like this. It's too kiddish. And when Lee asked what would his parents want him to do, he says, say thanks for the suit. On every one of these vignettes, he always said just how he would feel, um, but he always knew what the parents would want him to say. By 9 or 10, children should be aware that you can have more than one emotion at the same time. Kim's looking at her new bicycle that she's just gotten for her birthday, and at the same time, she's never ridden a bicycle, and she thinks she might fall off. So how does she feel? Well, she's probably going to be both happy and scared. Higher order theory of mind comes in again shortly after second order, and this can become quite complex. Person A is thinking that person B is thinking that person C is thinking that person uh, D feels jealous. Right? And then any kind of situation where what you say isn't what you're really thinking. So lies and figurative language and sarcasm. Now, there can be both cognitive and affective lies. Stealing your friend's iPad and telling him you have no idea where it is is cognitive. Telling your grandmother that her rhubarb pie is delicious, even when you really hate rhubarb pie, is affective. Figures of speech involve higher order theory of mind. You have to recognize the person's intent in the context. Emma has a cough all through lunch. She's coughing, and Dad says, oh, poor Emma, you must have a frog in your throat. And then sarcasm. Again, there's cognitive and affective sarcasm. And again, keep in mind that it's possible to be able to comprehend and perform adequately on one of these tasks and not the other. Here's an example of cognitive sarcasm. Boy and girl have gone to a party and there's a big table full of cakes and pies and, and candy and the boy rushes over and he fills his plate and gobbles it all down and he goes over and gets another plate. The girl hasn't even gotten any of these desserts at all and the boy's back filling his plate again and she says, oh, you're not eating enough. That's not enough food on your plate. Cognitive sarcasm. Affective sarcasm, Anne's mother has spent a long time cooking Anne's favorite f meal, fish and chips, and Anne's watching TV. Mom brings it in and grabs the meal, takes it off, and sits down and watches TV. Doesn't even look up at her mother or say thank you. Mom's feeling pretty cross, and she says, well, that's very nice, isn't it? That's what I call good manners. I gather that the show Big Bang is here in the UK. Most of the characters in that program have theory of mind difficulties, both cognitive and affective. Sheldon has the greatest um, problem with theory of mind, and here he's struggling with sarcasm. 
Penny, how was work? Great. I hope I'm a waitress at the Cheesecake Factory for my whole life. Was that sarcasm? No. Was that sarcasm? Yes. Was that sarcasm? Stop it. Well, sometimes people assume that if you have a cochlear implant, a Baja aid, or any kind of hearing aids, you have a hearing aid, so everything is okay. But implants and hearing aids aren't like glasses. They don't give you 20-20 hearing. The noted deaf educator Mark Marshak has said, children with implants are still children with hearing losses. And it's like they're looking at the world through a picket fence. They're only getting part of the information. So it's hard to know what's behind all of that. And so as they're processing theory of mind, they often have to process it ex explicitly. As they get language, they can learn that other people are thinking and feeling and they can talk about it. But processing theory of mind through language is slow and sequential. And if you're having to work to really listen and think about it, you're going to miss a lot of other cues. You're going to have difficulty with the implicit processing that involves simultaneously attending to multiple kinds of cues and integrating those all together. With pretty much any type of visual, significant visual or auditory deficit, there are going to be difficulties with implicit processing. That important cues for theory of mind will be missed. Here's if you're interested in more information from me, and this this was my first duck mocha, and that's why my email is mocha at unm. And I'll leave playing this little video clip. I think it all become, begins with attuned interactions and continues with attuned interactions. A baby whose cries were comforted. Grew into a toddler who comforts another crying child. A kindergartner who is able to take turns. A growing child who cares about others and does the right thing even when nobody's looking. An adult who is connected from the inside out. A parent who picks up his crying baby and inspires others to do the same. start a ripple and that's what we can all do have attuned interactions with others <laughs>